This is the man from Modesto. I want to weigh in on this conversation about whether or not atheists are more intelligent than religious people. So there's some kind of a implication that there's like a superior uh, genetic heritage, a superior something. Uh, so first of all, let's talk about just the comparison on, upon what statistic, upon what metric do you, you legitimately compare two groups of uh, religious philosophies? Uh, is it an academic performance? How are those two things related? It's like measuring fire with a wooden ruler, you know? You should be using something else to assess a temperature, the standard metric for heat, but instead uh, you're going to, you know, instead of measuring Christians by the proof that should be uh, assessed to a true supernatural understanding, which is, you know, Jesus said go out and preach the gospel and then heal the sick. So a true Christian, their prayers, their words result in sick people being healed, something that we can see all over the world with Christians. I've even heard testimonies from some Muslims who uh, healed people, and that is because God's word is powerful, and God said, I give you power over, I give you authority over basically everything in the world. And he didn't say, only as long as you proclaim Jesus. He gave it to first uh, Adam, had all authority over everything. Later he reiterated that authority with Noah, and then he reiterated, he reiterated it again uh, with Abraham. <clears throat> so we have this authority, but it's not owned solely, although of course uh, we do see it uh, powerfully practiced amongst the Christians because we understand the power of the name of Jesus. So we have this kind of a proof. So this is the metric you should, that should be used. Like, do you have some proof? Well, you know, the Great Commission, preach the gospel in all the world, and cast out the devils, cleanse the lepers, and heal the sick. You know, this is uh, the fullness of Jesus' command. And this is the proof that should be used. But instead, the atheist, he wants to use something where he looks good, you know. And we can understand this kind of a desire. Well, you know, hey, you know, the atheist claim is, well, we have more degrees and we do better on standardized exams. And yes, that is a proper reduction of the claim that we're more intelligent. An IQ test is a kind of an exam. Some people are just better at taking exams. Um, other cultures, they've never taken an exam in their life. And someone shows up and gives them uh, in Kenya and Nigeria, uh, you know, this is 70 years ago, an IQ test designed for British people. They've never taken any kind of exam before. They don't understand how it works. Uh, they're quickly indoctrinated, instructed, and given the exam, and they score, surprise, lower than the Brits. Well, of course not. You know, of course, one of the questions involves um, a knowledge of what is a tennis court, but there, it's 50 years before the first tennis court is going to be built in Nigeria, and uh, these guys are receiving questions about tennis courts on an exam. Surprise, most of them miss the question, you know, even less than what you would expect from random guessing. So, <clears throat> the atheist wants to claim a superiority based upon a, an old set, a comparison, you know, a comprehensive survey of uh, IQ tests administered to people of different nations. And then someone came through and said, well, what percentage of these people are religious? And by religious, they meant worship tree spirits. So we're talking about people who maybe haven't seen a pencil in their life are going to take a test. Worshipping tree spirits, worshipping, uh, we're talking about uh, Muslims in some of these countries, uh, Jainists, Buddhists, people who are all different religions. And then the atheist in America wants to compare himself to the Christian. And that's the primary application, that I'm superior to the Christian. Well, if you want to claim that, you need to get some academic results that explicitly show atheists versus explicitly Christians in America. You can't take this global thing... Uh, where everything's pulled together and then try to, you know, and legitimately it's, it's an extrapolation. It's not, it's not a fair application that I'm just going to, you know, apply that to this one group that I don't, whose results I diluted out with all these other results that I fully expect to be worse. And here's the other thing. The guy who originally did this study, 
His goal wasn't really to show the superiority of atheists, it was to show the superiority of whites. He was a racist. And one of the other uh, major conclusions of his uh, work was that uh, atheists have smaller penises. This was like uh, his other thing. So if you want to refer to that thing, uh, you know, with the you know, adjunct implication that you have a smaller penis, you're welcome to do that. I don't recommend it. It's kind of ridiculous. Now, granted, um, the ridicule of that study has become very popular in recent years. And more recently, someone tried to repeat the study, but it's the same kind of a thing with the same number of fallacies where they absolutely did not use uh, an appropriate uh, IQ test for that community and where they tried to scale it back to something else which is illegitimate for an IQ test. A proper IQ test tests one group with the test that's, that they can understand and then it takes a normal distribution, you give the median a score of 100, you scale it to 100, and then you distribute the other scores, the other values, so that the guy, you know, at whatever, 35th percentile, you know, he's gonna be whatever, 120 or something. It's just scaled out. This is what they decide. It's all, it's all scaled. You can look that up. My numbers may not be exactly dead on, but uh, it's scaled. So, uh, if you take a national IQ test for any country, the average guy should be 100. If you took a legitimate test and you wanted to compare that, they would all be 100. But they're taking tests that say, well, the average IQ over here is 67. Compared to who? Compared to British. Well, how do you translate that? Well, because we gave them the same test. Oh, you gave a test that makes sense to Brits, to some Nigerians? Well, no. And many of the tests, of course, are not all the same one test for the British people. There are uh, many different, dozens of different types of tests developed by different people with different scales and different errors and different methods, and then they're all compared as if they're uniformly the same. So there are a lot of problems with that study, and I don't think uh, you can quote it, and I personally don't give it any merit. For me, it's a meaningless study that doesn't mean anything. So, now I want to give a, a test. I'm gonna give you a test uh, to see how intelligent you really are. This is a really simple test, and you can compare any kind of people with this test. So here's the test. That's a test that measures your ability to make a good decision. So here's the test. I, uh, you can choose for free, this is theoretical, I'm not mailing anything out. Uh, this is a test for you. You can have for free this uh, organic coconut oil, uh, very healthy, world's best cooking oil, it says here, organic extra virgin, uh, trusted company, Nutip. Okay, so you can have that, or you can have uh, this uh, pin cap. It's used, it's a little bit beat up, but you know, it's still a pin cap. If you happen to have a uh, missing one of these, it could be of some value to you. So you get to choose uh, which one of those you want. Of course, you could also sell either one on eBay and uh, convert it to a cash value. You'd liquidate your prize, you know. So which one do you choose? So the obvious choice is I choose the one that has greater value. So if you're still with me so far, if you chose the coconut oil, then congratulations, you are capable of making a good decision. Now there may be, you know, the outlier who exactly needs this and is allergic to coconut oil and didn't think about selling it on eBay. He maybe chose the pin cap. Uh, you know, we could give that guy, you know, half credit or something. So now here's the next completely theoretical scenario. There's a guy in your hometown, multimillionaire. Uh, he really likes people. He wants to uh, just be generous to people. So he is going to give a new car to everyone who accepts his offer. Uh, every five years, he's gonna replace this car. He's gonna pay the maintenance, the upkeep. He's gonna pay for the gasoline, the insurance, uh, everything. He assumes full responsibility for the car. Every five years, you're going to receive a replacement car so that this car is never breaking down. Uh, you have a car for life. This guy is just gonna give it to you because uh, he chooses to. It's his choice. He has that resource he can give it. So he's gonna give you a new car. But the thing is that this guy, he's a little bit, uh, uh, unusual and um, he's also going to be offended if you don't accept his very generous completely free offer. He's going to be offended and um, he's going to send out uh, once a month a couple of big guys to come to your house, find you wherever you're hiding and give you a, a good thorough beating. A, a beating so bad that everyone who sees you for the next week will know, oh this person has been beaten. This, these guys are going to show up every month and beat you up for the rest of your life. So. Uh, do you accept the car or not? Do you receive the car? So 
you know, yeah, you say, well, this is a loaded question. Yeah, it kind of is, but you're going to see where I'm going, and probably most of you have already anticipated where I'm going. Uh, you should receive the car. Of course you should receive the car. Okay? Now, here's the next error. Now, this is actually a, a real offer that exists in reality, uh, but if you refuse to accept that, let's just uh, address it as a theoretical proposition. There is a supernatural being with the power to grant eternal life. Now, maybe this guy just evolved from some previous generation, uh, the only one of his kind or something. We don't know where he came from, but he exists. This is the theoretical scenario, completely theoretical. <clears throat> well, it's real. I, I accept that it's real, but you're welcome to uh, approach it as theoretical. So, this supernatural being can grant you eternal life, and he's going to provide for you a huge mansion, so large it really is the size of a city, and uh, it's going to be everything you ever need in this uh, eternal life will be provided. There will be no sadness, no tears, no suffering, no death. There's not even nighttime. Everything is day. You don't need to sleep. You have unlimited energy, uh, more a greater life than you can imagine. Totally free. All you have to say is, like the car example, I want it, and you're going to receive it. Now, this guy also has a penalty plan for those who refuse to receive his eternal life offer. And it is that he is going to put people into a lake of fire where they will suffer forever. There will be beasts there that will tear their flesh, bite them, torture them, do unspeakable things to them. The worst pain that somebody could imagine, you know, Stephen King or Stephen... Yeah, horror fiction writers could not imagine torments like the ones that are actually going to happen. So, this is the theoretical scenario. Which one do you choose? Which one do you choose? The no-brainer is the eternal life of joy and love. That's the no-brainer. However, I, now, and, then, and this is why I'm going to tell you that I don't think atheists are smarter than Christians. I don't think they are. Because I have seen many times, a large number of times, this comment spoken by atheists in videos or printed by atheists in threads, and it's this, well, if your God is so terrible that he would, you know, put people in this suffering, then I refuse to accept the eternal life of joy. Okay, so even if he's approaching it as theoretical, what an amazingly stupid answer. It shows a complete inability to make a common sense choice, to weigh out two things. Now, is it now throwing all theory aside? Let's take a look at the scientific method. The scientific method, in its modern view, really re relies on you know some peer review and some other things, uh, learning a proper format, how to write up to something. But then you also have to show numerically, which is almost always nearly exclusively done with statistics. And statistics, you need to read the book called Statistics Done Wrong. Statistics Done Wrong uh, is well written and will show you all the kinds of errors that come out. The way statistics was never really intended for its modern use in science. The way statistics is often misapplied. The way almost the way like 80% of all published um, uh, reports are actually underpowered, that they don't have enough sample size to actually measure the small amount of difference that they're claiming is valid. Um, there are a lot of reasons to see that statistics and the scientific method, therefore, are, fail to prove anything absolutely. There's always some small amount of error. Uh, the theory of the design wasn't set up correctly. Uh, the assumptions are actually invalid. Uh, the method of the, the choice of statistics they used was invalid, or else they used 10 or 12 different statistical methods until they found one that gave a, a good p-value. And uh, so there are all kinds of errors that can happen in order for you to receive a fact. So there are human errors, there are shortcomings in the methodology, and there are just, you know, innocent thought mistakes. So when you see something published, is it absolutely valid? When someone rejects God, is it absolute with, with science? 
Is there any way for them to ever prove without a shadow of a doubt that there's no God? No, there's not. Currently, there is not. We don't have a method to do that. So even, you know, uber God hater uh, Richard Dawkins admits, yeah, there's some chance that God could exist. So based upon this fact, and it's a fact, if you just deny that there's no chance God can exist, uh, you must be completely illogical because there, there is... There is a chance. It, just strictly scientifically speaking, not theoretically, strictly scientifically speaking, there is no way to prove God does not exist. You can't do it. There's no method at all. None. Now, let's quantify it. Let's use a simple business paradigm called a risk assessment. I'm going to say, well, if I'm going to put this money in this business, what are the chances it succeeds? And if it does succeed, what is my reward? And if it fails, what is my risk? What is my loss? I have to estimate my potential loss and my potential gain. And if I have a positive value, then, and it's the most positive of all the opportunities I have, then that's the opportunity I'm going to invest in. A simple business assessment, a risk assessment. So let's look at uh, the choice of accepting God or rejecting God. And we're going to assign some values here. These are going to be easy to... Uh, follow. So, uh, what are the chances that uh, God does not exist? Now, these are not my beliefs, but let's just say that um, the number is uh, 1 in 100 trillion that there is God. 1 in 100 trillion that there is God. And all the other chances say, no, there's not. So, we take this really big number and we multiply it. So, what is the reward? If I, if I reject God, what is my reward? Well, I don't have to go to church. Uh, I don't have to uh, give a tithe. I don't have to uh, give up uh, my lascivious lifestyle. I don't have to quit drugs because that's acceptable uh, without God. You know, anything that God would want you to do, that Jesus would want you to do, which really all center around living a healthy life, a life filled with love and joy. That's what God's plan is. And, and the things that he says don't do, it's because if you break that uh, principle, then there's usually consequences. So he's trying to, you're spared from the consequences by obeying those laws. But that aside, you know, let's take this really big number, you know, one, you know, one trillion minus one over one trillion times the value of that life. And it comes out to some number that's basically, effectively, you know, the value of, the value of life. So that's, that's your reward, is life on your terms. That's your reward. If you reject God, that's the gain. That's what you gain. So let's, Give that a value. Uh, I, I don't know, the courts I think recently said that a human life is worth about you know, 1.1 million or something. So let's just be really generous and, generous and say it's worth, uh, one life is worth $10 million. $10 million, right. So your reward is the equivalent of about 10 million bucks. Okay, now let's take that one over one trillion and multiply it times eternity in joy. So that's an infinite number. No matter how small this number is, no matter how, you know, you put a one over here, and no matter what size the denominator, when you multiply it times infinity, you get infinity. So if you want to try to quantify it, that's worth infinity dollars. It's worth an infinite, it's a priceless gift. So you have your $10 million overvalued prize over here versus a priceless gift. Which one do you choose? That's the choice. You know, Mathematically, just scientifically, that's the choice. That's the smart move because the gain is so huge. If God is true and if the promise of heaven is true, that is priceless, eternity in joy. But now, let's go back and look at this $10 million. You, all, you don't just receive this short life maximum of 120 years. You don't just receive this short life you know, valued it generously, very generously at $10 million. You also receive the follow-up eternal consequence of eternity in hell, which is like negative infinity, using the same math previously demonstrated. Negative infinity, that's the value. The value of rejecting God is negative infinity, and the value of accepting God is positive infinity. Those are your two choices. Those are the two values that are laid out. But some guy is going to make an emotional response and say, Well, how dare he 
propose that he should punish me. There's some arrogance involved. And there's no logical thought behind it. There's, you can't support that decision. Well, if your God would ever, you know, if he was so terrible, I want nothing to do with him. You don't have a choice in it. <laughs> in the theoretical scenario, he's an omnipotent God. He can do whatever he wants. You can try and prove something in the physical with some kind of an experiment and pretend to yourself that that has any kind of an implication at all in the supernatural, some realm you cannot measure or uh, completely perceive or understand in the physical. If you think you can do that, ridiculous. You can't. The atheist has no grounds to reject God, no scientific grounds, but he claims scientific superiority. He claims intellectual superiority, and he backs that up by his, with his GPA. Well, my GPA, really? What did you get your GPA in? Underwater basket weaving? Because no, in this country, because of the labor prices, you know, they don't have underwater, underwater basket weaving anymore. You know, that's a, a, a cheap labor resource in some poor country now. What'd you get it in? What's your income going to be? What's the value of your degree? Was it really a smart choice? Was it a smart choice? Your MBA, how much did you pay? How much of your lifetime did you commit to that? And how much is it really worth? MBA is worth actually zero. It's worth something to the guy who holds it, but to the guy who hires an MBA, it's worth a minus amount because they, studies have shown that MBA holders put out less work. And pretty soon that's gonna become well understood and people are gonna get less MBAs. Because the guy without an MBA feels he needs to prove himself. The guy who has it feels like that. I've got it. Just like the atheist, there's, a, there's an element of arrogance. Well, I, I have this degree so I'm a better person. You aren't. Maybe you're hardworking. Maybe you're more diligent. That might be true. That might be true. But it doesn't mean that you're a better person. And it doesn't mean that you make, that you're more intelligent than anyone. A person who is unfamiliar with the standardized exam, surprise, statistically speaking, he's going to do more poorly than the person who has spent a life becoming an expert at taking exams. <clears throat> There's no basis to reject you. The atheist is not smarter than the Christian. I think I very well demonstrated that right now. I think it's clear, I think it's plain that atheism is a kind of an emotional, uh, somewhat arrogant position, and it's backed up illogically with poor metrics, poorly selected metrics, just the metric that makes the atheist look better. And he just convinces himself that that's the truth because people are telling him that. But where's their proof? What is the mechanism and where is the experimental proof? That's what you need to show. And you don't have it. You don't have it. This is the man from Modesto reminding all of you who believe and trust and know in God to pray or be defeated. And for you, for you atheists, the comments are open. Let the personal attacks begin.